This episode of the Children's Literature Podcast is brought to you by Teenagers Freaking Out During an Emergency. Teenagers Freaking Out During an Emergency. Let's just all save time by accepting that this is a tradition that ain't gonna change. Last week, I took a look at the first of two poems that have a huge effect on the plot of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Bingin' on the Rhine by Carolyn Norton is a poem that Gilbert Blythe chose to recite in front of Anne as a way to tell her that he regretted having offended her and that he has, like, a super big crush on her. Today, we'll examine the other poem that has a huge impact on the story, Lancelot and Elaine by Alfred Tennyson. This is the kind of long, flowery, artsy poem that people just don't read anymore. It tells the story of Elaine of Astolat, also known as the Lady of Shalott. She's a tragic figure from the legends of King Arthur. There are a few different versions of her story, but the one told by Tennyson in his poem Lancelot and Elaine is about a woman who lives near Camelot. She falls in love with Lancelot, who blows her off because he's so into Guinevere. He treats Elaine with rather unchivalrous indifference, even messing with her heart a little bit before just kind of forgetting about her. The lily maiden dies of a broken heart, and her brothers load her into a boat and send her downriver to Camelot for some reason. Elaine's body washes up in Camelot, and everyone there laments her death. Nobody was like, why did somebody send us a dead chick in a boat? I guess things were different back then. Now, I made a mistake in the previous episode when I said that I would be talking about the poem The Lady of Shalott, and I have to admit it, I got mixed up. But I do have an excuse. Tennyson actually wrote two poems about Elaine, telling different versions of her story. Arthurian legends were told all over Northwestern Europe, and there are a lot of variations. A story from early medieval Wales might be pretty different to one from late medieval France. Lancelot and Elaine is definitely the one referred to in chapter 18 of Anne of Green Gables because Anne and her friends quote from it directly. That's the one where Elaine dies of a broken heart. However, I mistakenly mentioned Tennyson's other poem, The Lady of Shalott, in which case Elaine dies because of a mysterious curse. In this version of the story, the sight of Lancelot is what causes Elaine to bring the curse to its fulfillment, but he doesn't actually do anything morally wrong, and never realizes his role in the events. So why did I get mixed up? Well, it's because the beloved 1985 TV adaptation of Anne of Green Gables quotes from Lady of Shalott and not Lancelot and Elaine. I have no idea if this is a mistake or a deliberate artistic choice by the filmmakers when they were adapting the events of chapter 28. After all, later in the story, they have Anne recite the poem, The Highwayman at the White Sands Hotel, In the novel, she recites The Maiden's Vow by Carolina Oliphant, so this substitution had to have been a deliberate choice. Though I have to admit, it's one I have mixed feelings about because The Highwayman was published in 1906, and while the 1985 TV adaptation did shift the setting of the story from the 1880s to the 1910s, it's not a poem that Anne really would have ever known about or quoted from herself within the framework of the original story. Both Tennyson poems about Elaine, the Lady of Shalott, are the kind of thing that Anne would have loved, though. They're about sorrow, loss, magic, tragedy, death, irony, and lots of good romantic drama. So it's no surprise that in Chapter 28 of Anne of Green Gables, Anne and her friends decide to act this scene out. It's so hard for me to pick which one of Anne's scrapes might be my favorite, but this might be it. It's a perfect example of how teenagers have the enthusiasm to just charge in and do something exciting without thinking everything through, and then completely panicking and making the situation worse when something goes wrong. It's so relatable, and it instantly makes me remember things from my teen years that still make me cringe. Anne, Diana, Ruby, and Jane are all over at Diana's house, and they decide to go down to the pond to act out the events of this poem. First, they argue over who should be the lily maid, and Anne says no because she's got red hair, and how could you have a red-haired lily maid? But it's like, Anne, have you seen those pre-Raphaelite paintings? You can absolutely be a red-haired Elaine. 
But what really is going on is that the other girls are too chicken to get in the boat. So they say, oh yeah, Anne, it's fine. Besides, your hair's super dark. It's like not even red now. They grab some props and then they act out the story. Cloth of gold for coverlet there was none, but an old piano scarf of yellow Japanese crepe was an excellent substitute. A white lily was not obtainable just then, but the effect of a tall blue iris placed in one of Anne's folded hands was all that could be desired. Now she's all ready, said Jane. We must kiss her quiet brows, and Diana, you say, Sister, farewell forever. And Ruby, you say, farewell, sweet sister. Both of you as sorrowfully as you can. And for goodness sake, smile a little. You know Elaine lay as though she smiled. That's better. Now push the flat off. The flat was accordingly pushed off, scraping roughly over an old embedded stake in the process. Diana and Jane and Ruby only waited long enough to see it caught in the current and headed for the bridge before scampering up through the woods, across the road, and down to the lower headland where, as Lancelot and Guinevere and the king, they were to be in readiness to receive the lily maid. For a few minutes Anne, drifting slowly down, enjoyed the romance of her situation to the full. Then something happened not at all romantic. The flat began to leak. In a very few moments it was necessary for Elaine to scramble to her feet, pick up her cloth of gold coverlet and pall of blackest samite, and gaze blankly at a big crack in the bottom of her barge through which the water was literally pouring. That sharp stake at the landing had torn off the strip of batting nailed on the flat. Anne did not know this, but it did not take her long to realize that she was in a dangerous plight. At this rate, the flat would fill and sink long before it could drift to the lower headland. Where were the oars? Left behind at the landing. Anne gave one gasping little scream which nobody ever heard. She was white to the lips, but she did not lose her self-possession. There was one chance. Just one. The Tennyson poem is quite long, so I'll record it separately, but this is the extract that's relevant to the scene that we've just read. So those two brethren from the chariot took, and on the black decks laid her in her bed, set in her hand a lily, o'er her hung the silken case with braided blazonings, and kissed her quiet brows, and saying to her, Sister, Farewell for ever. And again, farewell, sweet sister, parted all in tears. Then rose the dumb old servitor, and the dead, oared by the dumb, went upward with the flood. In her right hand, the lily, in her left, the letter, all her bright hair streaming down. And all the coverlid was cloth of gold, drawn to her waist and she herself in white, all but her face. And that clear-featured face was lovely, for she did not seem as dead, but fast asleep, and lay as though she smiled. The outcome for Anne is less tragic and more comic. Lucky for her, as the boat passes under the bridge, she's able to leap onto one of the piles and hang on for dear life. But then, because Lucy Maud Montgomery enjoys torturing Anne Shirley for our entertainment, who should come along then? Yes, Gilbert Blythe in a rowboat. I love this chapter because it's about the total difference between fiction and reality. Anne had this whole big dramatic scene all worked up in her head, and it just fails. Every teenager has had something like this happen. Like, there was this one time in high school when a guy decided to come to my house and climb on my roof so that he could leave a note outside my window, except my parents thought he was a burglar and they called the police. So then his mother had to come and pick him up while the cops laughed at him and me, but mostly him. That's a true story. I won't be naming names though, but let me just say that, you know, I'm very sorry that you had to go through that kind of embarrassment. It's a funny story now, though. 
This chapter is also great because it lovingly mocks the excesses of the 19th century romantic movement. Like, it's fine to get swept up in the romance and beauty and exoticism of Arthurian poetry, but maybe let's all remember not to get too carried away. This year on the show, I've been paying special attention to works of historical fiction. And Anne of Green Gables is a book that never stops giving me new areas to research here. While it was published in 1908, it's a tender-hearted, nostalgic look back to the 1880s. And Lucy Maud Montgomery did an outstanding job capturing the popular culture of her own teen years. When I think back to my high school years, I remember how exciting it was to hear new albums by No Doubt, The Offspring, The Foo Fighters, and Smashing Pumpkins. For Anne Shirley and her friends, it would have been just as exciting to read about the legends of Camelot. Scenes from these stories were painted over and over by Pre-Raphaelite artists. The same painter would often paint the same subject multiple times, and the Lady of Shalott was one of their favorite characters to focus on. So when you read this part of Anne of Green Gables, you need to think of it in terms of a teen fad. Anne, Diana, Jane, and Ruby act out the death of the Lady of Shalott for the same reason that today's tweens might recreate a Taylor Swift video. Times might change, but those crazy kids and their crazy fads don't. When you're reading this part of Anne of Green Gables with your kids, you can read both versions of the Tennyson poem and learn more about the tragic figure of the Lady of Shalott. You can discuss whether or not you think Lancelot is an idiot, and you can talk about the irony of Anne being rescued by a dashing young gentleman in a boat, only to have her ruin it because she's still mad at Gilbert for having teased her about her red hair. Or maybe you can act out the tragic death of the Lily Maid, though I hope things go better for you than they did for Anne. (laughs) 